guys, it's been a while. This is uh, Dimitri, and I'm sitting here with Eric, and it's just us two because everybody else is lame. That's right, the brains of the podcast. Or as Eric wrote me earlier today, the barons of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, I misspelled that. <laughs> today we're going to talk about a movie. We've already talked about this movie before, and we know we completely disagree about it. So <laughs> we thought this would make a great first dual muscular exchange. Yeah, exactly. And that movie is... Dead Poets Society. Uh, Dead Poets Society takes place in a private school, uh, very hoity-toity, very uh, prim and proper, and we're dealing with a bunch of teenage kids. Uh, Robin Williams comes in, who is this kind of radical teacher that tries to make them think. And uh, constantly throughout the entire film, he keeps quoting uh, Walt Whitman and trying to make them into free thinkers, making them stand on top of their desk and calling him, oh, captain, my captain. And basically, uh, something goes horribly wrong uh, with a student and uh, everybody starts blaming the teacher that uh, was different that was uh, trying to do something different with, with the kids. And we see the impact that this teacher has on uh, all of these students. Uh, yeah, that yeah. pretty much sums it up. Yeah. And you mentioned something, is that he tries to make them think, uh, like make them be free thinkers. And that was my main problem with the movie, is that I didn't sense that. What I sense is that he was trying to make them worship him. Because I, I don't find he taught them anything of value in life apart from worship him. Like you mentioned the captain, my captain scene. And, you know, by the end of the movie, that's what they do. All they do is worship this guy. You know, they don't do anything for themselves by the end of the movie. They all do it for him all the time. That's not true. They do that. The little mousy kid, uh, Ethan Hawke, who's his, his first performance, he is so shy. He can't even speak for himself. At the end, he's the first one to stand on the desk and say, Oh, Captain, my captain. Yeah, he's it's the like first. It's like you took me out of my shell. Well, yeah, but he's the first one to stand up and give out his voice to what? To worship him. It's not to worship him. It's to say, you actually made an impact. Yeah, it's still about him and saying how great he is. It's not about the worship. It's about saying you made an impact. What do you mean by worship? No, but I mean like all the kids' actions are never for themselves. They're all in relation to how that makes him feel better. Yeah. Like to some degree, is there any single action for a kid that, that it's about uh, about themselves? Like they constantly go out and try to imitate what's out there. Eventually, it becomes for themselves. Eventually, they kind of find their voice. What's the first thing that you do when you start, like, writing a text? You imitate, like, every single writer that you read. Yes. Eventually, you find your own voice. Yes, imitate. But, like, so he's worshipping himself, and they imitate him worshipping himself. He's an egocentric. I hate that guy. He's not egocentric. He's trying to take them out of the shell, and he is doing a performance in front of them. He's trying to make it entertaining. He tries to make his classes interesting as opposed to, uh, you know, the boring Latin teacher that simply like, Rosae, Rosae, Rosam, Rosa, and they're just bored <coughs> stiff. They're just like regurgitating everything else. And here he is like completely throwing a wrench into the convention and saying like, let me show you something. Let me show you these pictures that you've seen a hundred times, but none of you really noticed. Yeah, you know how he does that? He does that by destroying books. And you know who else destroyed books? Yeah. The Nazis. I'm just saying. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And basically, he doesn't destroy the book. He destroys the introduction that says that this is how you should read poetry. And you should make diagrams, and this is how appreciative that it should be. He destroys Frost and Whitman books, he doesn't. if I remember correctly. He doesn't. Correctly. He destroys the introduction to the text of poetry. Ugh. So... And that what... becomes the big thing at the end, where you have the principal that comes back to teach into the classroom, and he says, read the excellent introduction, and it's like, well, none of us have it in our, our textbook. And it's like, aha, there you go, you're kind of forced to think on your own. 
<sighs> there's nobody kind of guiding you to to this. But well, guiding. You know. to... <laughs> okay. yeah, thank yeah, you, yeah, yeah. thank Sorry. you very much. You helped me yeah. so much with well, that. Well, teachers this always is... guide. One but, way or well, that's the thing. That's his job as a teacher to guide. That's the job of the school to guide, and he's destroying that guidance. And I'll admit with you, I hadn't catched that it was the introduction that he was destroying, or rather, I didn't remember it if I ever did catch it. And for me, it's like, it was such a shock where he was reading Whitman and he was reading Frost, both poets who are a, about free thinking, about going around the current, and like, and seeing him like tear off the pages. And I was like, oh, you bastard, how dare you? You know, like, yeah. he just, he put me off from the very beginning when he did that. <laughs> he says it himself. It's not the Bible. It's not a holy text. You know, it's just an idiot that wrote this introduction that has no idea what poetry should be about. And he does? And he does, he's just saying, like, look, you might get it wrong, but at least, you know, say it enough times. Like, read it for yourself. Why can't they just skip the pages instead of tearing them off? Because that guidance is actually valuable. I, I can understand that that guidance is not the only point of view that one should read it with, but it is a valid point of view. It is a valid guide into nah, the book. I don't find you know? it valid. Uh... Then again, I'm not going to rip up uh, books and, and stuff like that. I'm not going to do that, but uh, I'm not going to encourage my students to do it in class. Although sometimes I wish I did, because uh, some of these texts are absolutely atrocious, but whatever. <laughs> but yeah, I wouldn't do that. But at the same time, like we're talking about a movement, right? And yeah. it's like uh, the symbol of it. And it's just to, he does get that little hellraiser in a way, like uh, just to, to follow him. And he does to, get exactly him. to follow him. Yeah, but at the same time, he does guide him. Where uh, he does this stunt, and he reprimands him. And the student says, "What you're siding with, uh, principal?" In these, what about uh, sucking the marrow out of life? And William says, "Yeah, sucking the marrow out of life doesn't mean choking on the bone." <laughs> and here he is, like guiding him in a certain sense, like saying, "Like, look, be smart." You know. Yeah, but like, what is the lesson he's teaching them by tearing off the pages of the book, the introduction, and then guiding them himself? He's saying, no one else's guidance should you follow, only mine. Well, only mine. No, no, I, I think the minute that somebody would question him, he'd be like, okay, good for you, you're questioning. But we don't see that scene in the movie. Yeah, we don't see that scene in the movie because it's not about that. We see the, the, the kind of inspiration that he creates for the students where they themselves create a dead poet society. Now, the dead poet society is basically a bunch of boys that end up in a cave and uh, sit around and read poetry. Yeah. It's pretty queer, but... <laughs> a little bit. They do it on their own, like, uh, and they end up, like, having fun. They're reading, like, some of these poems and, like, tapping, and uh, they're starting to appreciate these things just for themselves. I see them more as an inspiration than uh, something to be worshipped. Now, do we worship inspiration? That's, that's another thing, but mm -hmm. I think, like, uh, he's really a catalyst, if you will, for inspiring them, and he does. And that's the point that uh, I thought was great. Maybe some of you know, uh, I'm actually a teacher. Um, no, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to say, like, I watched this movie. I'm like, oh, my God, I want to be a teacher. But I thought that was so interesting because, like everybody else, like, I've been in classes where I'm just bored out of my mind. And um, I thought, like, wow, that would have been cool having a teacher like that. Just funny that could relate, like, the subject with humor. Man, I would have been like at every one of his class. I would have been taking notes and really been into it. And um, that's something that, you know, now that I'm in front of the class, I do try. Uh, I'm not going to be as funny as Robin Williams because uh, I don't think most people can be. But uh, I'll try to make the subject as interesting as I can. There's one other thing I want to bring up because uh, you, you brought up that something terrible happens to a student. Uh, and when that thing happens to Wilson from House. Yeah. Uh, I found myself actually siding with the establishment at that moment because I actually do feel it's Robin Williams' fault because I feel that he he pushed a student to a confrontation to which that student was not ready and then just let him out in the open, suffer the consequences of that. And that student 
wasn't ready for that confrontation and and and, and everything else happens because of that and i actually do firmly blame him for that uh, I, it's just so irresponsible uh, I, I think you're completely wrong it's not his fault he tries to guide him as best as he can and he always has an open door and each and he actually says you need to talk to your father you need to tell him exactly what's in you and the kid can't do it he can't convey that to his father in that scene all of a sudden like his father becomes a confrontation and he says you never listen to me and the father stops and he said you want to talk go ahead but that kid... and he doesn't and the... this is the point that you know he's on stage he actually has a voice to tell his father that finally I want to do this, he doesn't have one. But well, that's the thing, he's not ready. And you have this other paternal figure, Robin Williams, going like, do it, do it. But he's not ready. He's not psychologically ready for that. What the hell is he supposed to tell him? Well, not so, wait a push minute. him to the point where wait, he wait, ends up doing minute. what he Robin ends up Williams doing. Robin Williams should have never inspired him to follow his dream, to do something like to do a play. Actually, he should he never... have pushed him to confront his father when he wasn't ready to he, do it It's yet. not a confrontation. He just said, say how you feel. This movie takes place in the 30s, I think? 30s, yeah, 40s? Yeah, about that. Yeah, at that point, that's a confrontation with your father back then. Yeah, okay, I'll give you the word confrontation, but at the same time, I mean, what the hell else is he supposed to say? Shut up, and actually, he says, like, worst case scenario, if you end up in military school, well, that's two years, and then you can do whatever you want with your life. But the kid's a teenager. Of course. Two years in military school of feels course. like an eternity. Of course, but what the hell else is he going to say? He's not going to tell him, like, run away <clears throat> from your, your family. No. He's not going to tell him, like, uh, stab your father in the neck or something like that. Although that would have made a very different movie. Yeah, it would have. <laughs> yeah, it would have been the Dead Father Society or something like that. Uh, it's the Oedipus Society. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but at the same time, like, they find an scapegoat and they, they find Robin Williams and they completely uh, attack him mm -hmm. because uh, he's different. He's not, like, teaching the traditional curriculum. Yeah, well, he is destroying books. He is destroying... Yeah, he's destroying shitty introductions. Education's what? expensive, man. And, like, you know, those schools, they pay for these books, man. That, yeah, that yeah, hurts yeah, the budget. They, yeah, it hurts the budget. At the same time, like, uh, you know, as a teacher, like, I, my goal is to make my students think. Not to make them regurgitate, like, whatever I say. But that's exactly what they do. They regurgitate whatever he says. And what is it that he says specifically? Well, for example, the old captain, my captain, is actually a callback from what he brought up. Yeah, because he's being, like, funny. Yeah, but they're regurgitating it. Yeah, yeah, but kids do that. The but, but why is it that when the kids regurgitate for the quote-unquote institution, it's like, that's bad. Yeah, when yeah, they regurgitate for Robin Williams, that's, that's a blessing. That's, no, that's not, what I, <laughs> like, that's not what I mean. I do that all the time with my students where I tell them, like, look, you can call me Mr. LeHu or you can call me Captain Awesome. And it's just like me going, like, hee hee, I am so funny. I walk through the hallways, I hear, hey, Captain Awesome. And that becomes kind of like the inside joke with the students. Yeah, but the difference is you actually teach your students. He does teach them. Well, I mean, you don't see the scenes where he's uh, telling them to write poems or something like that. We see absolutely none of these scenes. That is true. Uh, of course, we don't see the academic stuff because, let's face it, it's boring. But I have no evidence that that academics actually is there. Well, the academics is there because at one point they had an assignment that they have to uh, present their own uh, written poem. And, uh, you know, you have like the, the, the guy that does like the, the least amount of work. And it's like uh, the cat is sitting on the mat. And it's like, yeah, OK, just because I make jokes, you think that this is a joke. Yeah, you didn't really work hard on this one. huh? can be about simple things like a flower or whatever. Just don't make your poem simple. Mm. make them extraordinary and I thought that was a great line and uh, that's also the scene where he actually takes like the shy Ethan Hawke and all of a sudden like shows the class that this kid has something inside of him you know he's so encased in himself and boarded up and so shy and everything else but there's something inside that's worth taking out and yeah those do worship him 
<sighs> you would worship. Like, no, I don't no, see no, that. This, this time it was being difficult for the sake of it, but... I, it, unfortunately, that kid never comes out of his shell. Yes, he does. Actually, Until... that's not true. That's exactly what he does. He steps on the desk and says, yeah, well, oh, uh, Captain, uh, my well, captain. That's... Everybody imitates him. All of a sudden, he becomes the leader well, of the class. I, I wasn't finished with my sentence. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I was going to say... He never comes out on, uh, out of his shell until it is to thank him, which if you're going to go with the angle that Robin Williams benefits these kids, that kid should have come out of his shell for something of his own, not to, you know, thank Robin Williams. Because then for me, it comes off exactly like how I put it. It comes off like he just learned to worship his teacher and nothing else. No. Like he, if they had shown a scene where this kid actually comes up to a girl instead of the other boys who are kind of jockey and good looking and would have come up to girls anyway okay well you know he's like you know he's learning the ropes but he does none of that all he does is go like oh hey guys that that guy was awesome let's all worship him and everybody's like yeah you're right man it's like that's not coming out of your shell no 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 no. i think you you don't even need to see him talk to the girl he actually stood up in but he didn't of... stand up for himself. He stood up for his teacher. He stood up for his teacher, but you know that he's going to be okay after. I don't get that feeling at all. I get that feeling at all because he actually had the balls when everybody else was sitting there in the classroom, not even willing. And he's the one that stood up and thanked him. Everybody else imitated him, but he's the one that actually had the balls to stand on that desk. And that was... I mean, yeah, because he's come on, that he brainwashed. Can, by can his... you actually tell me that you were not moved by that scene? I saw the movie the first time. It was probably around 11 or 12. And yeah, I cried like a third grader on the first day of camp, for sure. But then again, it's because I was 12 or 13. And you're sort of like in that age where you tend towards hero worship. But like, as I watched that, that movie, just a couple Let's of years... Let's watch it right now. I guarantee <laughs> you're going to cry. But just a couple of years later, by 16 or 17, I was a little bit revolted by it because I, I feel to a certain degree, you know, and, you know, talking to you, I know you do that as a teacher. You teach your kids to, you know, stand up for themselves, not stand up for yourself, you know? No, but they don't... Oh, I, 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 think, I think it's the, the one part where everybody's, like, firing uh, Robert Williams, everybody's putting the blame on him, and the one thing that the kids are actually saying is they're standing up, literally, for him, and he tries to tell him, like, "Look, I, I, I never meant to uh, write blah 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 that petition." And Robin Williams says, "I know, I know. You know, you don't even need to explain. It's fine. He's taking like full blame for everything, and he's kind of saying like, it's fine. You know, he's almost saying like, please sit down and just continue your life. You're gonna be okay." Mm. And this one kid, he's standing up for him and saying like, "Thank you." Mm-hmm. Thank you for bringing me out of my shell and actually telling me that it was worth something. Mm. Nobody else has done it. And that kid is living in the shadow of like one of the best students that ever graced like uh, the, the, the school, which is his big brother. And mm-hmm. him, he's not like that. He's very shy. He can't express himself. And at that moment, he actually has the balls to stand up and say thank you. This is the one thing that I realize as I'm saying this. Uh, as a teacher, I have no idea. Who is the kid that I have an impact? Mm-hmm. My first year of teaching, I concentrated a lot of time on this one kid named uh, Calv, who was particularly brilliant. Um, and it turns out the year after, I was in the same school, and uh, this one kid, very shy, uh, Derek in the back, uh, asked me for an interview because he was doing a French project, and he had to interview a teacher that had like the greatest impact in his life. Turned out it was me. Oh. Yeah. I had no idea whatsoever. Uh, he was just a really shy kid that never spoke. He would ask me a couple of questions or everything else. And I was like, well, what is it that I did? I had no idea. And he's like, well, you would tell stories. You would, like, encourage us. I'm like, wow, that's really nice. And this is what made me realize that I have no idea who is it that you'll influence. Mm-hmm. Uh Maybe it's one kid, and it's not the kid sometimes that you spend so much time with. Sometimes it's the one kid that you're like, you okay? You, you, oh, I'm just having a rough time. Okay, well, I'm here if you need. And sometimes it's just that. Mm-hmm. It's the weirdest thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't know. And uh, for that, seeing that scene, and even talking about that scene, like uh, 
it's probably the greatest gift that uh, those kids can give him. And you can tell he's uh, welling up at the end and saying like, thank you, thank you. And it's true, it's not the entire class that's standing up. No, no. There's a lot of kids that are still sitting down and saying like, uh, and, but there's a few that he really moved. And I thought that was great. Yeah, um, it's great for the teacher. I don't see how that's great for the students. I think it's, I, I think, think it's the students the... eventually they'll they'll never forget that. I mean, you you don't really know what's the the seed that you put in, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it becomes a bit like the movie Inception, right? Uh, an idea like it becomes a virus, like it just spreads and spreads and spreads. So all of a sudden, to get somebody that says, "Hey, you're worth something, and you can do something with your life, and do something original, and actually try." Uh, sometimes that has an impact and you you never realize okay I can tell you this I'm a teacher I got kicked out of three schools so um, as, as a student you got kicked yeah. out of three schools yeah 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 oh man that sounds so bad if I say it like that uh, yeah I've never been fired as a teacher and most likely never will be uh, but um, and this one teacher uh, Lauren Michaud she would teach uh, literature and for me, that's where I became alive. I love that. And she has no idea what she did. But next thing you know, I went to university. I studied English literature. And mm. so you don't really know what's the impact you'll have. Right. So, yeah. And to see that. And I don't think it's necessarily worshipping. I think it's simply thanking. Thanking him. <clears throat> and eventually, like, they'll, they'll come into their own. Hopefully. I mean, you never know, right? why we have such different interpretations of the movie I think it's more on a technical level I think the, the, the movie relies a lot on us having good faith in the narrative and I reached a point where I did not because uh, as you pointed out I misinterpreted the scene where the, he tears off the books and I saw somebody tearing off books that are actually celebrating freedom and like tearing them off in the name of freedom and I thought that was so stupid I lost faith in the movie from that point on and I sort of interpreted the movie very differently from that point on that's because you weren't listening. No, you I were being the bad student. Because uh, if you look at the movie carefully, and instead of seeing Robin Williams as a teacher, you see him as a cult leader, none of the students' actions are inconsistent with people following a cult leader. And that's kind of weird to me. But you see that in university. Going to university is basically going into a cult. I agree with that completely. Um... But yeah, I don't necessarily see him as having like a cult in the sense because if he would have a cult, he would always be there kind of like, oh, but no, he rarely sees the, the boys like outside the classroom, like all of the shots, like basically it's what he says in the classroom that has an impact. So yeah, I don't really see him as a cult. Like if I would see him as a cult figure, I, he would be there in the cafe and be like, oh, this is the way you do the revolution or... This well, is does, how you should do the poetry. You know? He does more or less teach them the revolution. I mean, like that's the act of tearing uh, off the pages of the book. Like, it, 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 there, there is that aspect in the way he teaches. Yeah. And, well, well, again, it does a... fly at the convention of what is... Uh, yeah. Yeah. For sure. And, and to a certain degree, another objection I had when we reached that scene is like, oh yeah, because if there's one thing teenagers absolutely need to be taught, it's how to rebel against authority, because they never do that naturally. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, but at the same time, like when we're dealing with the 1940s, like we're talking about like uh, first time that you're starting to deal with like uh, teenage angst, and all of a sudden, like that became something new that that was kind of like the blossoming like uh, teenagers in a way. And then you had them, you know, you always had young people rebel against authority for sure. Um, but this was the first time that we were starting to label like teenagehood. Mm -hmm. Just the creation of high school became the creation of adolescence. Mm -hmm. Because before you were a child, then you were an adult. But then all of a sudden, like with industrialization, you didn't have people that were qualified enough for a job. So what did you have to do? You, not that you would warehouse them, but they would have to be more skilled. They would have to learn more stuff. So that's when you create high school. Um, and yeah, you know, in most high school film, like you kind of get this feeling that they're wasting their time, mm. you know, they have tons of energy and like nowhere to spend it. There is an act of rebellion in, uh, tearing up the, the introduction, but I also think that it's, uh, the part that look, 
let's shake you up a little because you're just regurgitating everything like all these dictations and everything else look wake up i'm gonna make you think well try mm -hmm. and uh, yeah for for me i think that scene is a bit more of that like saying like look this rigid way of looking at poetry this is complete bullshit like uh let's change it so i think it's more about that mm. Let's talk a little bit about the technical aspects of the movie because it's quite actually, beautiful. It's it's really well shot. Yes, it's gorgeously shot. This is Peter Weir, right? Yeah. So yeah. master and commander himself. Yeah. The, uh, the 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 campus is gorgeous. The the images of fall is and the juxtapositions so are fantastic too. Like there's uh, for me, I always remember there's this one scene where you get. Uh, this kid that's uh, biking through like all of these geese and then you see them like flocking about and the next shot you just hear them like ah 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 the next shot you get like all you of the kids having sex? no 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 well you know how geese like their uh, uh how they mate no <laughs> what's the cry they do i have no idea what a geese does i was gonna say chirp but they don't chirp they uh scream out or whatever and then you get the next shot of uh, the kids coming down the stairs, being loud and talking and everything. And I thought, like, wow, that's such a nice juxtaposition. You get the, the birds, like, all in the circle, and then you get the kids, like, coming down, circling the stairs and away. Right. And yeah. being loud, just like the birds and everything else. And I was like, wow. And this is just, like, one of uh numerous uh great shots that peter weir does yeah no it, it's absolutely a gorgeous movie and and like, as you said really well put together like really well edited and uh i mean like let's face it this is a performance that put robin williams on the map as, as, as a performer i mean there was also a uh, good morning vietnam but like, yeah. these two movies together convinced it, all of us it's that not popular not... what's interesting about robin williams is because um it showed him with a heart like this was the performance where he could do his ad lib mm -hmm. he could do all of his improv stuff and you can tell like it's, it's obvious a lot of stuff is improv oh yeah uh and it's basically like look just put him in front of the kids he'll make them laugh you know just because he likes to do that but at the same time like uh it was like one of those teachers that's funny but they can teach you it's kind of funny teaching the minute that the kids like you mm -hmm. you can pretty much do anything you know you can do that really... sounded so creepy yeah uh, yeah but i don't mean it that way i mean you could pretty much make them learn any oh that sounds <laughs> creepy too uh... <laughs> i'll just stop now uh <laughs> but yeah the minute they like you like uh you you can teach them yeah but I, 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 again, then that's the difference in our point of view. I don't remember scenes where he actually uses that. You know what I mean? I, I see the scenes where he seduces them and gets them to trust him. And he's in a position where he could influence their lives. And then I don't actually see the scenes where he influences their lives positively. The, the, the movie takes for granted that part. It, it assumes that you as an audience are going to assume that he does that because he's a teacher and he's the good guy. But I don't find that the movie actually shows any of these scenes, and that for me is what's missing. There was a great line in um, the the office, uh, you know, the Ricky Gervais one, and they had like the Christmas special. And the last Christmas special, they talked to uh, the guy that uh, was flirting with the receptionist, and uh, he's saying like uh, people we work with, we're basically sharing like a piece of a floor. Mm -hmm. uh, they're complete strangers and every now and again you get somebody that's a ray of sunshine that you've never expected and that due to circumstances they came into your lives like you would never have met them otherwise and it's a bit the way that I see it in a way for Robin Williams coming into those kids life it was a ray of sunshine like it was something that was completely different <clears throat> that they'll talk about for the rest of their life now will it have an impact you know, all of those, let's say, 10 students that stood up on the desk, how many of them will he truly have impact? Well, we know that Ethan Hawke, he will have impact. What's he going to do with that impact? Well, that's something different. Uh, you know, it's kind of funny that uh, when you read, like, uh, James Joyce's uh, short stories, like, they always end up with an epiphany. And I was like, well, what happens after an epiphany? Mm. most of the time not much <laughs> you know <laughs> hopefully this kid did come out of the shell for good and did something completely extraordinary with his life mm. so yeah i think it ends up on a hopeful note 
And um, I like that. I sure as hell don't see it as worshipping. So your rating then? My rating is an A. An absolute A. Not an A plus? An A? Uh, actually, nay. It is an A plus. Nay, uh, it is an A plus. Yeah. But I'll, I'll, I'll level with you, Eric. Uh, you've changed my rating for it. I was going to give it an F. Oh. I was going to give it an F because I felt I was completely pandering to teenagers, to their worst instincts, and glorifying these worst instincts, and transforming that glorification into glorifying him, instead of teaching anything. And I thought the movie was doing that intentionally. I thought it was pandering to the worst instincts. But, you know, the points he brought up, the fact that I did misinterpret one of the key scenes in the movie, uh, as you pointed out, and also a lot of the things you bring up about what it's like to be a teacher, I'm going to change my mind. Uh, I still think the movie has a problem. I think the way I interpreted the movie is valid in the sense that it is easy to interpret it this way. And I, But I don't think it's intentional anymore. I think it's just because they skip some parts and assume the audience would sort of just root for the guy because he's so likable. And let's face it, Robin Williams is extremely likable oh, in this yeah, movie. Oh yeah, for sure. And sort of forgot to sort of actually show those moments of moral core that I, I personally needed as a viewer. So I'm going to give it a C minus, where I think it's it's a problem with the narrative and not so much ill intent, and because you know otherwise, as you pointed out, it is a really well made movie. I just really feel that there these parts were missing in the movie. Um, one thing, um, since we're talking about teachers, and you mentioned uh, one teacher who influenced your life, what was her name again? Uh, Lauren Michou. Well, I, I had one as well. Her name is Anastasia Kazakos. Uh, she was my ninth grade English teacher. And I actually, in 11th grade, uh, went to see, because she left, she was just there for one year. And I actually went to see the principal of our school because I wanted to thank her because she meant a lot to me in a very difficult time in my youth. And he refused. Really? He didn't believe that I wanted to thank her. And I went like, if you don't want to give me her address, can I give you a letter and you can forward to her? And he goes like, go to hell. Really? Yeah. Oh, so, that's just disgusting. Yeah, it's really sad. And I'm sure that the teacher would have like really liked that. I think so. She was my English teacher. She threw me into a writing contest because she said that I had something to explore there. And two years later, I sold my first story at the age of uh, 15 wow. to 16. And five years later, I decided to be a writer. And today I'm a writer and editor. So she had a huge impact on my life at yeah. a very difficult time. So her name is Anastasia Kazakos. And if you're still teaching and some of the kids are listening, you have a really great teacher with you and I hope you uh, you take advantage of that and uh, if you are listening Anastasia thank you yeah <laughs> absolutely well that's it for us I guess yeah <laughs>